Welcome one and all to the newest series on Reveal in Light. The focus of this set of videos will be street medic treatment, information, and general safety tips for activists of all kinds when on the streets. Please note that I have not been formally trained to be a street medic, so any information passed on from me to you is only a collection of tips and practices I have put together for educational purposes and to raise awareness. Consult a local street medic coalition in your area for further guidance. Anyway, with that disclaimer finished, I would like to formally welcome you to the first episode of Dial M for Medic, where we will be discussing hypothermia and hyperthermia. Although these two terms are simple enough to grasp from our everyday experiences with language, let me break them down a little. Hypothermia, from the Latin root words hypo, meaning low, and thermia, meaning temperature or heat, means that the body is too cold to function and perform necessary visceral functions, or ADLs, which are activities of daily living. Hyperthermia, hyper, meaning high, thermia again meaning temperature or heat, then is the reverse of this condition. It's when the body is too hot to thrive and perform basic metabolic functions. We need our bodies to stay within a very narrow range of temperatures to maintain equilibrium, which is anywhere from 96 degrees to 99 degrees, usually around 98.6. However, environmental conditions such as rain, sleet, snow, hail, wind, frost, sun exposure, prolonged humidity, and cramped quarters or overexertion via exercise and movement can hamper our internal temperature regulation. When a person is involved in activism, they can often become involved in their demonstrations and forget to keep their body stable and healthy. Here are some tips for being safe while outside or inside where temperature conditions become unstable. I will be speaking about hypothermia treatments and prevention practices first. Number one, drink plain water with no additives. Cold water is best, but really, as long as you can get any source of clean water that hasn't been baking in the sun or in plastic, you should be okay in less than ideal circumstances. Note that drinking more will cause you to urinate. So please be aware of where you can use a bathroom. Do not, and I repeat, do not, consume caffeine or alcohol or any super dehydrating diuretics during a demonstration. Not only will they go right through you, you'll be impaired and potentially arrested. Going to a protest loaded is a great way to get arrested for disorderly conduct. Number two, keep watch over the weather. In particular, if you know you're going to be in a fairly open area with little shade or the ability to go inside. Sunburns and sun damage to your skin, especially for fair-skinned people, is dangerous over a period of time due to melanoma and other cancerous skin conditions. If you are like me, you also use skincare treatments for acne. If you are on tretinoin, especially if you've just started it, skip it the day you have to be outside in the direct sunlight or alternatively apply it at night. Otherwise, you will turn into a piece of overcooked bacon. The drier your face and skin are, the more moisture you lose and the more dehydrated you become. Number three. This is a no-brainer, but wear clothes that let your skin breathe. If you're wearing, say, tights or leggings, those are going to trap heat and sweat within your clothing, leading to blisters, abrasions, and rashes. It's also hard to take off or cut off clothing that's stuck to your skin if they must be removed ASAP to get to an injury. Cotton is best. In addition, wear sunscreen that is SPF 50+. You can reapply it if you're sweating a lot or if you get wet. Uh, God forbid it's a substance like tear gas or pepper spray though, in which case I recommend you do not, do not, please do not, 
put any oil-based products on your body or any sunscreen near your eyes because the oils will emulsify inside the sunscreen and stick to your body and hurt like hell. Be aware that sunscreen, if applied in a cream form, can get into your eyes if it melts. Also, if it's an aerosol, it, it can get in your eyes if you spray it or if the wind comes by. And again, remember the whole tear gas prepper spray debacle. Number four, keep an eye on your urine color. This one also goes for hypothermia. If it's light or straw colored, that's a good sign. If it looks like apple juice, you either have a UTI, which you would probably already know about, you're taking medication that alters your urine color as a side effect, or you need to drink more water, and that one is probably the case. <laughs> In this case, you can drink Gatorade, Powerade, or the like, but water is still best. If you're diabetic and your blood sugar is getting low, other than doing these standard procedures, have a little juice pouch with you and something that metabolizes fast, like pieces of chocolate. Also, carry a packet of salt on you. I'm not going to explain fluid replacement in its entirety here, but you don't want to only replace water. You need to replace salt, sugar, and electrolytes like calcium and potassium for muscle movement and coordination. Ergo, a, mix a bit of salt and sugar into your water for a big boost. However, be aware that too much sugar is a bad thing. Check the nutrition label and don't go for more than, say, uh, 5 to 10 grams of sugar. Number five, try to cool off gradually with wet coldness rather than dry coldness. A wet washcloth will do you good if you can keep it cool. Seek out a local street medic, as their number one import is going to be some kind of rehydration. Trust me. Number six, if you take prescription drugs and one of the side effects is increased sweating, fluid loss, and urination, Dizziness, low blood pressure, sensitivity to light, or skin irritation, be very careful. This will mostly apply for people who have kidney disorders and high blood pressure, or who have hormonal problems such as acne or menstrual conditions, but it can also apply to those who are on anticholinergics, a class of drugs used for many types of medical conditions, including Parkinson's disease, COPD, asthma, diarrhea and urinary incontinence, motion sickness, and more. The trouble here is this. By decreasing your ability to eliminate fluids like sweat and saliva and urine, your body will steam like a vegetable in a cooking pot. And this is not an exaggeration. Combine that with the environmental risks of a sunny day with 100 people standing around you, well, maybe not in COVID times, but it still applies. And you have a recipe for heat stroke. Not to mention, it also is a full risk if you pass out. Number seven. If you are sick with any kind of stomach-related illness, do not go out to a protest unless you have access to a bathroom and a lot of fluids plus your medication. If you are constantly vomiting, having diarrhea, or are too nauseous to hold anything down, you will not be able to get enough sustenance in your body to keep going for hours on end. Number 8. Do not take medications such as epihedrin, Sudafed, which is pseudoepinephrine, prednisone, unless instructed by a physician, or antihistamines before a demonstration. All of these medications have a tendency to increase your heart rate and body temperature. Speaking of, if you feel your heart rate increasing suddenly and you're not doing anything except standing in the sun, get out of the sun and get to shade or a place to cool down. Your heart should not need to exert itself merely to keep you standing up. It means your body is too hot and your heart 
must work double time and dilate your capillaries and other blood vessels to keep you cool. That leads to a blood pressure drop which, as we know, can lead to a fainting episode. Number 9, and this one is short and sweet. Sip any drinks slowly, cause if not, you might bleh, vomit everything back up. Number 10. Sunburn is more likely to happen between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Treatment for sunburn is as follows. Remove the person from the sun, and this will most likely be a few hours after the damage is done. Cool the area with water and calm the irritation with aloe vera, steroid creams like cortisone, and here's the caveat for the cortisone application, only apply it if there are no blisters or open wounds. And you can also give the person anti-inflammatory gels and medications like Tylenol and Advil. Well, as long as, you know, they're not allergic to it or they don't have kidney problems or high blood pressure because generally people who have those can't take Advil, but they can take Tylenol. If the sunburn is severe, though, please see a doctor. You can wrap the area afterwards after you're done putting the gel on, the aloe vera, the cream, etc. Number 11. Sit down from time to time. Fatigue will quicken a person's descent into heat-related illness. Number 12. A person who has had a stroke or has another neurological disorder might not be aware that they are heating up quickly. To check and see if they're too warm, take your thumb and feel for their pulse either on their radial artery, which is located on the wrist's thumb side, and that's commonly the one people do when they take your pulse, or in the junction between their jaw and the left side of their upper neck. If it's abnormally fast, they need to get help. You can also check a temporal pulse, which, as it sounds like, is on your temple. A quick skin pinch on their hand won't hurt either. If the skin takes too long to sag back down, they need to drink something and rehydrate. Note that older adults will have a longer time naturally because their skin has lost elasticity, but if it's more than, say, 6 seconds, they should get help. Number 13. Heat exhaustion is the milder form of hyperthermia. Shakiness, clammy skin, double vision, headache, and dizziness are common symptoms. If they didn't hit their head and aren't confused, um, but if they are, they need more medical care than a non-licensed personnel can provide. Lay them down and put an ice pack on their neck, wrist, chest, and groin if they allow you to. These are all major sites of cardiopulmonary activity. And finally, for this section, Number 14. If a person starts to have a seizure, call 911 immediately. This goes double if they enter into a cardiac arrhythmia, which for, you know, someone on the outside who's not a medical professional, this is hard to tell unless you have some kind of EKG machine on hand or like a telemetry unit, which you won't have. Um, but when in doubt, call an ambulance. If someone is unconscious, remember, they are NPO, meaning nothing by mouth. Don't put anything in their mouth. They could choke, and that would not be good. Next, I want to discuss treatments and tips for combating hypothermia. Number one. Being wet and in the rain during a storm is one of the number one ways to get hypothermia. If you're immersed in the wind, in addition to freezing your butt off, it's going to make everything feel that much more cold. If you can, change into a fresh pair of clothes or bundle up over the wet clothes to insulate yourself. Like I stated in the hyperthermia section, it's not recommended to wear clothes that are too tight, especially if you already have circulation issues i.e. if you're a diabetic, for example. This means no compression dressings, no compression leggings, no compression socks, 
unless you've been asked to wear them by a physician. Improper dress is one of the number one ways a person gets hypothermia. Number two, shivering means your body is already at a point where you need to seek warmth. Involuntary shivering, shivering you can't control that continues for extended periods of time, is a sign of a serious medical condition called circulatory shock and is pretty severe hypothermia. If a person cannot stop shivering and has been doing that for five minutes or more, get them help ASAP. Number three, frostbite can come in a few forms. Redness is the first indicator that there is not enough blood in the extremities. This is worsened by water penetration. As such, please wear boots that have no tears in their fabric and gloves or mittens that have no holes and are thick enough to be immersed in snow without taking on moisture. Once you see redness and the numbness sets in, the extremities may start to turn a whitish blue and this may be a little harder to notice on someone who is darker skinned, but you can check their other mucous membranes such as inside their nostrils and also if you can pull back their lower or upper lips, you can see their gum line. If that's starting to turn whitish blue, then that is a sign of hypothermia. This is a more advanced form of frostbite that needs immediate attention via a warm pack, blankets, even more advanced medical help if possible. Four, a person can slip on ice and get hurt, especially if they are being pushed and shoved. Black ice, which is ice hidden from view, is dangerous and can lead to falls, fractures, concussions, etc. As such, try to have shoes with good grip so they won't slide on the ice. This is less of a problem if you're in a metropolitan area, as community plows will salt and plow the roads to get rid of a lot of the ice before it gets too bulky. Number five, addressing diabetics once more. If you or someone you know is diabetic and is not well controlled or has PVD, which is peripheral vascular disease, they might not feel the effects of frostbite or hypothermia setting in. Check in with them and ask if they can wiggle their fingers and toes. Take a pen and poke them and set appendages multiple times in different places. If you have some medical background and you're not bad at this like me, <laughs> feel for a pedal pulse on the foot. I will put a diagram on the screen so you can see what I mean. A person with hypothyroidism gets hypothermia quicker because their bodies cannot regulate temperature as quickly. Other people to check in on more frequently include people with open wounds, especially on their d lower body. Again, diabetics will sometimes have um, ulcers on their foot. People who have sustained head trauma and those who are malnourished. Number six. Some fabrics soak up chemical weapons. And again, this was mentioned in the hyperthermia section. I thought I would mention it here as well. Police have also been known to turn the hose on protesters, so be prepared to change or to dry off in a warm place if they start bringing out the hoses. Number seven, wear a hat to prevent heat loss from your head. However, if you start to sweat, take a layer off because sweating will cause you to dehydrate and will cool you down, which is not what you want in this circumstance. Number eight, eat regularly, since consuming food is a metabolic process that generates heat and energy. Warm drinks such as tea in a thermos and hot chocolate will do wonders. No caffeine though, don't want to dehydrate. We still face dehydration in cold weather, though it's less noticeable and you will also be inclined to urinate. When you get cold, your blood vessels constrict and your blood pressure rises. Ergo, your kidneys, which regulate your blood pressure, then dump the excess fluid into your bladder to drop your blood pressure back down to equilibrium. Ergo, more urination. Number 9. Avoid alcohol. 
When you drink alcohol, your body releases less antidiuretic hormone, the hormone that tells your body to conserve its fluids. If the body stops making this, you have more diuresis through your urine. Alcohol also raises your blood pressure and heats you up, making most people too hot. Once they feel too hot, they start undressing. Number 10. One sign of hypothermia is the inability to do complex motor activities. See if they can catch something you throw at them. Another is confusion. Ask the individual to say the alphabet backwards or to do a math problem. If the person seems like they're confused, take their temperature with a the thermometer. If it's dropped below 95 degrees or 295 degrees, they are hypothermic. Their skin will be cool to the touch and may have a pallor. Check their sensation with a pen. Number 11. Once hypothermia progresses, the person will not have control over their shivering as I stated above. This is because the body is trying to warm itself and diverting all blood to the core and brain. Slurred speech and blurred vision are signs you need to call an ambulance. Cognitive issues may be present. If a person has been shivering constantly and then stops altogether, this is an emergency. The person may faint or lose the ability to contract their muscles voluntarily to walk. The absolute worst thing to see, and I hope to God you don't see this, is pupils that are either different sizes from each other or super small or super big. This means there is damage to the central nervous system. The pulse can be weak and the breathing can turn shallow. Number 12. Besides getting out of the cold, wetness, and wind, get the person some blankets. Get a hot compress or heating pad. However, don't warm them too quickly or with severe heat, especially if they have moderate or severe hypothermia. No super hot water either or immersion in a hot bath, but a quick hot shower is okay. If they can, have them move around and get warm via exercise. The core should be first priority. Hand warmers are a good, a good tool. Do not put anything super hot or super cold directly on the person's skin. Put any hot compresses on major arteries, such as the neck, chest, groin, and stomach. And finally, number 13. When in doubt, call 911. Some things just can't be done without advanced trauma care and medical technologies, especially if you require resuscitation equipment or medications. Generally, you're going to want to get the person's consent before you call 911, but I mean, if they're unconscious and they need help, they need help, you know? It's like, you rather would save someone's life and keep them healthy than, you know, have them die on you. God forbid. So, just use your best judgment. But with that, that will be all for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the first episode of Dial M for Medic. Stay tuned for the next video. As always, please be healthy and safe until we meet again. Bye-bye.